we learned of a woman of enormous courage, wisdom, and strength. Professor Deborah Lipstadt has dedicated her life's work to fighting, she continues to fight to this day to preserve the memory of the Shoah, those who perished, and continues to fight against anti-Semitism across the world. While it is deeply moving to learn of such a courageous figure, it is rare to have the opportunity to meet, even virtually, to hear directly from a person of such courage. I am very proud to introduce to you this afternoon and express my gratitude, our collective gratitude to Professor Deborah Lipstadt whose uh, credentials Rabbi Kroll mentioned earlier, and I wanna cherish the time that we have now. It is my great uh, honor, and thank you so much, Professor Lipstadt, for being with us this afternoon. Professor Lipstadt. Thank you very much, and thank you for those kind words. Um, I've been talking to groups all day, including to 10,000 high school students yesterday, more, starting yesterday, uh, about this issue. Um, but when I spoke to those students who stretched from the northern provinces of Canada to uh, the southern borders of the United States and from one end from the east to the west, I was talking in the main to students who had studied very little about the Shoah, who knew very little about the Shoah. I explained to them that uh, this genocide, because of course we've seen other genocides and the Shoah was preceded by the Armenian genocide. Uh, remember that Hitler at one point said to his inner circle over uh, dinner, um, who today, before the Shoah, who today speaks of the Armenians? In other words, they were forgotten, close to a million were murdered, deported in the, in the most horrific circumstances, which would only be made even, uh, you know, pale compared to what happened to in the Shoah, but still mil a million murdered. Um, who today speaks of them? In other words, they're forgotten. These people will be forgotten too. And had the Germans won, that probably would have been the case. Uh, but but the what I pointed out to them, and to some degree, to paraphrase Shakespeare, this may be bringing Coles to Newcastle to an audience of students at SAR. The thing to remember is that the Shoah, while it has similar elements to other genocides and mass killing, and mass killing of men, women, children, defenseless people, the Shoah has unique aspects. First of all, state-sponsored, though other genocides, such as the Armenian genocide, the Rwanda genocide, whose anniversary was, happened to have been yesterday, um, were state-sponsored. In those cases, the perpetrators were only going after uh, the people within a certain area. In other words, in the Armenian genocide, the Turkish government was not going after Armenians living in Berlin or other places. In Rwanda, uh, the Hutus who were doing most of the murdering were not going after the Tutsis who were living outside the borders of uh, Rwanda. But in the Shoah, there was a, the only way I can describe it, an insane, insane uh, preoccupation with getting every Jew you possibly could. Even towards the end of the war, when it was clear that the Germans were, were losing, the, the Russians were approaching from the Eastern Front. Uh, the Allies had landed in Normandy. The Americans had landed in Italy and were moving their way up. Rome was already liberated. Hungarian Jews were being killed, were being murdered. And when Eichmann was ordered to stop the murder of Hungarian Jews uh, for a variety of reasons, he still managed to squeeze out one more train, get one more train out. Or I don't know if any of the students here have uh, come from the Rhodes Lees community, from the community, the Jewish community of Rhodes, which is an ancient Jewish community, one of the oldest Jewish communities. Um, in June and July of 44, the Germans sent boats there to, to deport that community, to decimate that community. 
because they were, as we might say, in Hebrew, Mishugala Davar, crazy, committed to this murder. And it went from one end of Europe to Libya, to Rhodes, to so many other places. And that, in some sense, it's, it's, is what distinguishes the Shoah from, from other genocides. So we remember today, we remember today also, and I think it's exceptionally important today in the day and age when there is such division in our country, such hatred in our country, such lawlessness, as we saw on January 5th on Capitol Hill. Um, um, some of the people there wearing Camp Auschwitz shirts, and I don't know if you know what one of them had said on the back staff. So whether he was saying Auschwitz happened or didn't happen, but had it happened, he would have been happy to staff it. One of the things to remember is that genocides like the Shoah and the Shoah itself did not start with killings. When Hitler came to power in 1933, on the end of January 1933, he may have had in his head the desire to murder all the Jews. There's sort of hints of that in his book, Mein Kampf. Uh, but I doubt that he thought such a thing would be possible. I doubt that he thought such a thing would be even possible of German Jews. But it's what we call the drip, drip mechanism, the drip, drip process. So he comes to power. First, he starts. Uh, prosecuting any, um, persecuting any of his political enemies, socialist, communists. But even, even as that is happening, he's beginning to go after Jews so that Jewish lawyers are fired, Jewish judges are fired, uh, Jewish teachers are fired. May 1st, you have a book burning, many books by Jewish authors and books by non-Jewish authors through Helen Keller's books uh, were, were burned because she believed in world peace and to the Nazis that was an anathema. Uh, and then it goes on and on, 1935, Jews in the Nuremberg laws are deprived of their citizenship. And then it goes a little further, Jews forced to live in certain Judenhaus, a Jewish house that forced out of their apartments, or benches in parks are, there are special benches for Jews only. Now, it may seem um, that, okay, look, we're talking about the annihilation of of one out of every three Jews on the face of the earth, how important is it to cite Jewish benches? Um, but I was, I, and I learned, uh, was reminded of how important it is when I was reading the uh, memoir, writing the introduction to the memoir of Lucy Adelsberger, who was a doctor in Auschwitz and then went on to be a doctor at Mount Sinai, where she did very important research on blood and hematology. Um, she was at, uh, in the United States on Kristallnacht, night, November 1938, and she was lecturing at Harvard. Not, no small thing. Um, and the people there said, stay, we can arrange for you to get a visa, we can get you on the waiting list, etc. But she went back to Berlin. Crazy, huh? She went back to Berlin because she had a widowed mother. She was an only child. And her mother depended on her to get food, take care of her. And she writing about her mother in her memoir, she says that one of her mother's small pleasures when everything else was deprived of her was each day to go to the park and sit quietly on a bench, unidentified, this was before um, Jews had to wear the yellow star, where she could at least enjoy the park and be anonymous. But once she was forced to sit on Jew, the nor for Juden, the benches only for Jews, that anonymity was gone. That moment of uh, tranquility was gone. But it began step by step by step, and it starts with words. And I want to emphasize that. And you heard in the a segment, at least the segment that I saw that was played of denial, and I hope you'll watch the whole movie because one should never see segments of a movie or read segments of a book, um, that for David Irving, it was, he was motivated by a number of things, but his anti-Semitism and his racism and his misogyny were part and parcel of a world view. And I think it's so important in this day when we say, well, I'm only going to, some people say, I only care about the anti-Semitism. It's uh, to paraphrase the Talmud, it's, it's our ox that's being gored. Why should I wait to worry about others? 
Well, I think if we're going to fight anti-Semitism, we have to re- we have to fight other isms too. It's, sometimes it's hard to do. We have to do it because on moral grounds. If it's wrong for us, it's wrong for other groups. We have to do it on strategic grounds. I'm reminded of the fact that after the terrible attacks at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, um, the Pittsburgh Jewish community was just in awe of the way the entire Pittsburgh population, all different communities, religions, ethnicities, et cetera, came forward. And there was one small ethnic group that came forward and, and someone asked them, well, how come you're, 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 you're coming, you're donating your time, you're trying to help, you're showing up at all the memorial services. And the man said, when our people em- immigrated to this country, uh, we had nothing. And Jewish Family Service was there to help us. And now we want to help you. Um, and it's, it's sometimes hard to do that, especially in a day and age when there's anti-Semitism, to just want to group about our own. But I think it's exceptionally important that we do that. The final message I want to give to you is um, that I feel very lucky. It may be strange to say that. Uh, but I feel lucky because... Um, There are many people, including I'm sure many of you watching and listening today and participating in this program, who would like the chance to stand up to the anti-Semite. When someone comes to kill you, what we're taught, get up earlier and beat them first. Um, David Irving came to kill me, not physically, of course, but came to kill my reputation, came to kill my um, identity, uh, and, he, and by so doing, he was aiming to cleanse himself. You know, I had no choice but to fight him. If I hadn't fought, fought, fought him, he would have won by default. Uh, in British libel law is the mirror image of American libel law. In America, if I were to say you libeled me by what you wrote about me, uh, I would have to prove that you libeled me. In Britain, if I say you libeled me, you as the author of the words have to prove the truth of what you said. So if I hadn't fought him back, he would have won by default. And even though there were many people who said to me, including other academics and even Holocaust historians, Deborah, don't waste your time. Holocaust denial is like flat earth theory. Uh, Who believes them? Well, I said, if I don't fight him, he wins by default. If he wins by default, uh, then he can say, Deborah Lipstadt libeled me when she said, I, David Irving, am a, a Holocaust denier and I'm not, and ipso facto, therefore, um, my, David Irving's view of the Holocaust is correct. There were no gas chambers. There was no uh, plan to kill the Jews. It's all made up by the Jews. So it was, I had no choice. Nonetheless, I was lucky. And um, the hardest moment for me, I mean, there were many hard moments, sitting, uh, coming to, into court each day and being stopped by Holocaust survivors. One day as I was walking into court, um, cousins of mine who had come from Israel to be with me uh, during the trial uh, stopped me as I was. I just arrived and they said, Deborah, there's a survivor here who wants to speak to you. It was during a very difficult part of the trial and I thought, I can't go give chizuk, give uh, strength and all, emotional uh, strength to a survivor. Uh, I'm hardly holding it together myself, but my cousin said, no, 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 she insists. They had come all the way from Israel, what I couldn't walk across uh, the lobby of the courtroom to talk to this woman. When I approached this woman, she handed me a list, a list of names, and they all had either the same last name or middle name, uh, uh, Yisrael, Israel Jacobs, Samuel Jacobs, Sarah Jacobs, uh, it was the Jacobs family, that's, I'm, just, I'm not using the real name. And next to each name, there was a date of birth, precise date of birth. And then sometimes there was a date of death, but in most cases, there was a question mark. And she handed me this list. And obviously, this was the list of her family of people who had been murdered. And what do you do when someone gives you a list like that? You you read it through. You read each name. There are no words to say. So I, I, with my body language, I tried to express my empathy and my sympathy. And I gave it back to her. She got very angry. 
She said, no, no, this is my evidence. You must have this. You must take it into court with you. And on that day and for many subsequent days of the trial, that list sat open on the table in front of me. So so why do I feel lucky? It was a six-year battle. It was a difficult battle. It took me away from family, from friends, from my home. Um, I spent a lot of time in London not going to theater and not going to museums, but sitting in court or sitting in lawyer's office. I believe I got to do Chesed Shel Emet, and you all know that Chesed Shel Emet uh, is, is when we are either part of a Hevra Kadisha, or we go to a funeral, or we help bury, we help fill in the Kever, uh, we visit uh, um, during the Shiva, and it's called Chesed Shel Emet, of course, and again, I know you know this, uh, because all the other uh, all the other Chesed's we can do visiting the sick, welcoming the stranger, et cetera, can be ones that reciprocate to us. One day we'll be a stranger someplace. We'll be stuck someplace for Shabbat and someone will invite us and it will be reciprocated. Or we never think we'll be ill, but if we go visit someone and help them when they're ill and take care of, take care of their family, their house, their carpool, whatever it might be, uh, someday we may need that. But Chesed Shalomet, of course, is the one Chesed that can't be reciprocated. And I got a chance to stand up and speak um, for these people to ensure them that they would not be uh, forgotten. Um, but the trial began in January and it ended Erev Pesach. And during that um, period on uh, Purim, I went, of course, to the Megillah to hear the Megillah in the London synagogue. And the Megillah happens to have my second favorite uh, verse in the Tanakh. Um, and it's, I think, in Perak Dalit in the fourth chapter, where um, Mordechai sends a message to Esther that she has to go to the king to protest and Esther says, you know the story, of course I can't go because to go without being summoned, you can be killed. And Mordechai has no patience for that. And he says, don't think that if you, you, you'll be saved and, and your, people, your people will be destroyed, but you'll be saved. I knew I was part, I was standing there. Yes, he was suing me, my name was on all the legal documents, but I was there uh, as a representative of the Jewish people and particularly those who had been so directly impacted by the Shoah. Um, but then he goes on to say something else. Um, he says, first of all, if you don't do this, someone else will have to do it. If I hadn't fought him, someone else would have had to fight him. But finally, he said, and this is the, the Pasuk that speaks to me so strongly, Miodea in Laet Kazot, he got Lamachu, who knows if not for this very reason, you became queen. Um, now, I don't consider being sued by David Irving being queen of anything. But Miodea, who knows, and I say this to you, to the students listening now, Miodea, who knows at what moment uh, you might be called upon to stand up to answer someone. It could just be in the, on, the, on the ball field or, or in, the, in a store when someone makes a crack about Jews or a crack about other people or does something that, that you know is morally wrong. Um, me, Odea, if you haven't had this chance today to get this kind of education, if you hadn't had a chance over these years at SAR to get the education that you've gotten, to have the morals instilled in you, uh, me, Odea, who knows? You know, it's, it's when you're walking down the street and you see someone collapse from cardiac arrest, it's too late then to say, I'm going to go learn CPR. You got to know it ahead of time. Your education is preparing you. It's preparing you not just to build a, a Jewish life, but it's preparing you uh, to stand up, to stand up, to do chesed shalemet, to stand up for those who can't stand up for themselves, for those who are uh, in trouble, uh, to speak out, to speak out on behalf of truth and of justice and of history. So I thank you for this opportunity. I wish you well. And I hope in the words of Tilim, you go, Mikhail Lechayel, from the strength of this learning to the strength of this acting upon what you have learned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lipstadt, for those uh, 
powerful reflections and that important message. I think you spoke to the heart <laughs> of all the students in this virtual room. Um, we're grateful to you for spending time with us today um, and to students and faculty out there. We hope over the course of the day, there have been uh, different kinds of exposures and learning. And you wanna just take a couple of minutes now um, in your groups to please uh, reflect. So we're going to um, close uh, this session and ask you to head off to your uh, next group for some moments of reflection. Thank you all very much.